in on it. I see the flying car industry as game changing when it comes to not only future warfare, but future military operations, uh, just as important humanitarian relief operations, hurricane support, all the things that we do defense of the homeland. If you start thinking about these devices as nodes in a network, it fundamentally changes the game. Agility Prime is a program with a vision of world impact. By partnering today with stakeholders across industries and agencies, we can set up the United States for this aerospace phenomenon. Potential outcomes are rewarding and transformative with both military and commercial applications. I want to offer my congratulations to Dr. Roper and his team for achieving this revolutionary rapid contracting and prototyping method to bring industry and DOD together to develop this new exciting technology with both military and civilian applications. This technology will have great benefit to the needs that we have in Alaska and the Arctic where conventional aircraft, vehicles, and vessels oftentimes can't operate. Agility Prime is part of our Defense Department's long history of turning futuristic ideas into reality. I'm proud that the federal government is investing in revolutionary ideas. Agility Prime is leading the way. This launch of Agility Prime is so exciting. This technology has the potential to make vertical flights more affordable and more widely available. And with the encouragement of the U.S. Air Force and the entire federal government, American companies employing American workers can gain a head start and win a fair share of this lucrative market. EV tolls have the same agile, vertical takeoff and landing capabilities as helicopters, but are quieter and should cost much less to operate because of their electric motors. We are becoming a trusted innovation partner in commercial tech. I could not be prouder of this initiative. I could not be prouder of this team. And I am excited to see how quickly we can go to help commercialize this market for our nation so that our warfighters have options they don't have today and our nation has an economic advantage far into the future. Innovation is a battlefield and Agility Prime is just one way we're going to win it. Agility Prime seeks to ensure a global advantage in advanced logistic technology. Agility Prime can reduce the risk of adversary commercial dominance resulting in military disadvantage. As the United States Air Force looks at generating combat power away from runways, those distributed logistics aircraft must be runway independent. This new transformative capability is a promising opportunity to conduct that mission in an affordable and a scalable manner. Today we gather for Agility Prime to drive transportation innovation lower barriers to entry and automation technologies make the requirements on the pilot much less and uh, and we see uh, flying as being accessible to a much wider range of people it is a truly a great credit to agility prime they can put on this virtual event with so many hometowns of the united states represented you know, industrial base is not really about just what a country can make. More than that, it's about the people who dream up what to make. And then, of course, those people who make it. Hey, good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for our Agility Prime webinar, uh, slightly switched day here to Wednesday uh, to get what we have for a phenomenal panel today, talking through simplified vehicle operations, the idea that eventually uh, everyone, or at least more people than today, uh, will have the opportunity to be a pilot through the fantastic technologies that are being put together. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to the Agility Prime tech lead, 
Uh, Frank Delsing, he has been in charge of all of our testing uh, and working on our airworthiness pieces out of the Air Force Research Laboratory and helping to help us think differently about this. Uh, we have begun some of the initial discussions with great help of our industry partners thinking about what training looks like into the future, thinking uh, about how to start bringing into our Air Force the capabilities to do simulation uh, in the very near term with some of the contracts that we have, and then looking forward upon completion of some of those airworthiness capabilities, the opportunity to start flying. So got a great panel here today uh, with a fantastic moderator with Frank. Frank, thanks for your time. Thanks for all of our panelists here today. Over to you. Thanks, Colonel Diller. Uh, it, it's really a, it's exciting opportunity for me to be here today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and, and show you some of the, the experts that we have here to talk about simplified vehicle operations. Uh, on Agility Prime, as, as Colonel Diller mentioned, I'm the technical lead. So that essentially means I'm, I'm focused on airworthiness and test side of things when it comes to the orbs uh, that we're looking at uh, for the Agility Prime program. And so obviously simplified vehicle operations is an area that's very exciting for us in terms of the technology that's getting developed. So we've got, uh, we've got a great panel here today. Uh, um, we've got uh, representatives from government, from industry, from uh, standards agencies, from consultancies. So you're going to hear some really interesting insight into uh, some of the work that's going into simplified vehicle ops. So before I get started and start handing it off to the panelists to start giving you the information that you really care about, I thought I'd at least set the table and give you um, at least my perspective on, on what it means when we talk about SVO or simplified vehicle ops. So. In my mind, it's really kind of a spectrum. Um, if you go back to the Wright brothers' uh, original flyer, you know you had an airplane that was arguably pretty difficult to fly. Uh, it, it was unstable in pitch. It took a lot of work on the pilot just to keep the thing flying straight and level if it if it flew at all. All the way forward to today, you get an airplane like the F-35B model that has um, that has a unified flight control. Uh, system so that that so that it's seamless for the pilot when he goes from forward flight to vertical flight and everything in between. Well, so where does simplified vehicle ops fall on that spectrum? Well, you could argue that the unified flight controls of the F-35B are simpler than maybe what you saw in a Harrier. But I think what we're talking about when we say SVO is we're going beyond even what you see in the F-35B to the point where we start looking at increasing automation, autonomy. Uh, and some of the things that the airplane system itself can do can do to reduce to the pilot workload really to the point where uh, you start to see some of the requirements for pilot qualification and currency and things like that to uh, to get to the point where you can start relaxing some of those qualifications. And I think that's when you start to hit that that kind of sweet spot of simplified vehicle operations, because otherwise we're just talking about making an airplane easier to fly. But there are reasons that we want to go beyond just making it easier. Um, you know, there's economic reasons, there's business plans, there are things, and you'll hear about that, I'm sure, from the panelists today on, on why we'd want to go there and, and take this beyond just making it an easier airplane to fly. I think some of the other topics you, that we can talk about today is certification. Obviously, if you're talking about a new uh, kind of more advanced approach to a uh, system. Now you have to start talking about how you're going to design that system, how you're going to test that system, how are you going to certify that system, ensure safety, how are we going to get public acceptance around this sort of thing, and really what kind of timing do we expect to see on these kinds of things. So listen for those themes as we go forward, and, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have a really good conversation uh, to, to get the, uh, to really get the discussion started on, on where we see simplified vehicle ops. So I want to introduce the panel. First off, we have, uh, Mr. Dave Sizu. He is the, uh, he's a flight test pilot at the FAA, um, and a former, uh, Air Force test pilot. So true to, uh, true to my community there. And, um, he's currently, uh, working in the area of, uh, some, uh, basically small vehicle or, uh, kind of more part 23 traditional, fly-by-wire kind of thing. So obviously SVO is very near and dear to his heart. We've got Mr. Greg Bowles, who is our uh, government affairs. So he's the guy that I touch base with a lot on the Jovi platform. Uh, so you'll get to see some exciting 
a little peek behind the curtain maybe for uh, for Joby's approach to simplified vehicle ops. We've got Anna Dietrich, who is uh, the co-founder of the uh, Community Air Mobility Initiative, so Cami, and she's also working on the AC-377 standards uh, group there. So we'll get to hear about some of that. We've got Dr. Uh, Matt Dilsaver, who I work with closely here in the lab. He is an autonomy SME um, and also comes out of the flight control section of the airworthiness office. So obviously a lot to say on where we might go with this in terms of uh, certification, in terms of tests and that sort of thing. And then finally, last but not least, Mr. Robin Rydell, who is a partner at McKinsey and Company providing really some interesting insight on the industry as a whole and uh, why and where the simplified vehicle ops might be going. So that's that's what you've got to come. Uh, and I know everybody's pretty excited. So I'll, I'll go ahead and dig right in and we'll get started with uh, with Dave's uh, CISO. He is, like I mentioned, uh, a test pilot in the FAA and aircraft certification. He's working on uh, kind of setting up some of the rules and some of the ways that we can certify um, these smaller aircraft with the fly-by-wire controls. He's got, if you're interested in reading it, some really interesting papers out there on uh, handling qualities and uh, and tasks and things like that, setting up really more of a, a DOD approach to how we would certify uh, some of these more complex and uh, complicated aircraft. Uh, got a lot of history there. You can read it there. I won't read it for you, but um, uh, lots of flying time, uh, really a lot of a lot of thought time as well, thinking about these things. So uh, I'll, I'll hand it off to Dave and, and let him take you through his introduction. Okay, Colm, check. can you hear me okay? Gotcha. All right, thank you, Frank. So today I'm gonna present uh, an FAA approach to evaluate automation functions. So I only have five slides and we'll keep it at a very high level, but I look forward to diving into some of the details in the question and answer session. And again, uh, the goal is to give you uh, an FAA certification perspective at the aircraft level. There are many uh, levels of FAA certification. Today, I'm gonna be focusing on the aircraft. Next slide. So as Frank uh, alluded to, SVO, what is SVO, Simplified Vehicle Operations? Uh, it means many different things to many different people. And it, I was talking to Frank earlier today, it hurts my head to talk about SVO without having context of what vehicle are we talking about? Where is the pilot? Is the pilot on board? Is he off board? What are the inceptors or how the pilot interacts with the vehicle? Um, and, and we'll get into that a little bit, but I'm going to try to keep this at a high level to kind of cover all the different use cases. Um, I'm going to introduce a new acronym probably to some of you, and that's, you know what SVO is, but SHQ, Simplified Handling Qualities. Again, at the aircraft level, I, from a certification perspective, this is a new paradigm if you have an aircraft like Frank was talking about, where you have reliable automation that takes care of some of those stick and rudder skills that all of us pilots have, have had to demonstrate over the years. And you have to demonstrate on your biannual review. Oh, great. I have a computer restart here. Hopefully it's not going to knock me out. <laughs> Speaking of automation. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, that was not prompted. So uh, simplified handling qualities, again, at the aircraft level, very important distinction. I'm gonna talk about aircraft level. Um, and what we're talking about is things that don't require traditional pilot skill sets. Now, SVO in, in general, encompasses much more than the aircraft, right? It's the whole ecosystem. It's the mission, concept of ops, and all the things listed on the slide. Okay, um, to give you some context, you know, there's some groups that have been working on definitions of SVO. Um, Gamma has done a lot of work in this space, flight level engineering, and um, what I'm gonna talk about today is, is kind of, relevant to orbs or eVTOLs, 
It's also relevant to fly-by-wire in conventional aircraft. But for a use case, let me just uh, talk a little bit about easy fly. We're using a, a single engine piston fly-by-wire aircraft and have a flight control system that is uh, based in um, flight path with automatic envelope protections and uh, uh, automatic ground collision avoidance, where you have protections in angle of attack, G loading, low speed, high speed, pitch, bank, all integrated. So keep that in mind as we go forward. But if you have, if you're flying a plane like that, um, that has automatic turn coordination, automatic speed trim, do you really need to test pilots in the ACS and the PTS the same way we conventionally do? I would submit that at the aircraft certification and at the pilot certification, that opens up a whole new paradigm and we have to rethink the way we certify airmen and aircraft. And next slide, please. So here's the problem statement. We do have regulations in place for fly-by-wire, and we know how to certify fly-by-wire. We've done so with Boeing, Airbus, Dassault, Gulfstream, Embraer, Bombardier, et cetera. But if you look at the stability and controllability rules that are written into FAR Part 23 and Part 25, we don't really have adequate means of compliance or how you demonstrate, how an applicant demonstrates that they meet those, those rules. We also have special class airplanes, uh, 2117B, and right now we're handling that with special conditions. Next slide, please. So here's some possible solutions. Uh, there is an advisory circular, and there's a method called HQRM. Next click, please. We're not gonna use that because the transport standards branch in the FAA says that we have to do something better. Cooper Harper ratings, these are uh, a system of evaluating an airplane that looks at pilot workload and pilot compensation and task performance. And it's very subjective. All trained test pilots are very familiar with this. We don't wanna just use straight Cooper Harpers. We're gonna find an area to integrate those tools in our evaluation methods. Next click, please. So that brings us to what we're proposing of how the FAA will certify uh, ORBS and SVO aircraft. We're drawing from what was done in the military with fly-by-wire helicopters and a helicopter military mission. They used a, um, a, a, an approach and it's outlined in ADS-33. So I, assembled a team of experts to look at what was done in ADS-33 and actually apply that same foundation of ADS-33 to the civilian world. We're calling those mission task elements and handling qualities task elements. Next slide. So yeah, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. So here we are with mission task elements, handling qualities task elements, they're repeatable tests very important that it's based on the vehicle con ops and it's tailored to evaluate specific compliance to the regulation as well as safe flight ops within the flight envelope. So it must link to an aircraft certification regulation. At the same time, it should also link to what the vehicle is designed to do, i.e. the concept of operations or the mission. Next slide, please. In the part 23 world, the regulations that, that we're targeting for these techniques of testing involve the 2300 flight control system regulations. That's more of a systems regulation, but then also the stability and controllability regulations you see listed there, 23.2135 and 23.2145. The key takeaway is we're using a new approach to holistically assess the pilot machine interface for compliance to the regulations as well as the target level of safety. So that's a quick overview. I think I'm about at 10 minutes, so I will turn it back over to you, Frank. Hack, that was uh, that was a really good introduction. Thanks, David. It, 
I can certainly relate to the the uh, the Cooper Harper ratings and all the training that went into learning how to run through that. It it seems simple on the on the front end, but boy, learn how to do it well. Um, it, it takes a lot of work there. So I can certainly see how that would be a limiting factor. Uh, one of the questions I had for you was, um, how would you how would you see using the handling qualities technique um, to update or relax the pilot training standards? Do you see any way of maybe tying those two things together? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, I do. If, as I mentioned before, if the aircraft has certain functions that normally the pilot would do, but now the system is taking care of that, you don't need to, you shouldn't have to demonstrate those same uh, functions uh, in the PTS. Uh, there are a couple of different um, initiatives where we are working with our cohorts in flight standards on the FAA side to actually go in and look at the PTS and the ACS at the private pilot level and the commercial pilot level in order to revise them with these new class of vehicles. So there is a, there's a link there between the certification side and the, and the pilot standard side in the FAA then? Absolutely. It's an inextricable link, and uh, I don't think you can really separate them. Uh, we, we have to change our rules in aircraft cert, and flight standards need to change the, the way they certify airmen. And, and, uh, and one more question. I, I think, and maybe, maybe Greg can chime in on this one too, even though he hasn't presented his slides yet, but um, do you see maybe the possibility of using your handling qualities testing? So in other words, finding areas where maybe the handling qualities are a little more difficult, require higher bandwidth from the pilot to start uh, targeting how you would design or where you would focus your design efforts in simplified vehicle ops. It, it seems like there would be an opportunity there to, to help focus your, your design team on where they want to uh, you know, use their precious time and resources to, to start making things simpler. Greg, do you want to take that? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and, and I'll walk through this in a little more detail. Uh, but essentially, um, when we look at, at the skill sets that, that are really hard to automate and, and, um, and versus augment, so Creating good stick and rudder skills is something we've been doing for a long time with fly by wire systems um, and, and with even basic autopilots that are out there uh, and envelope protection systems. But what's hard to do is to do some of the non deterministic things that pilots bring to the table. So, some of the idea, I think, and what Dave's getting at is, is if you can um, remove the need to, to always have that um, rub your stomach and tap your head thing or vice versa going at the same time while you're, while you're trying to do those executive functions that humans bring to the table, while you're trying to uh, think about the weather, think about the emergency, think about the time pressures and what the traffic's doing. Um, having you process that I need to deflect an aileron or uh, add some collective or cyclic and then change the RPM and um, to manipulate the aircraft in the direction, right? that's not where we should be focusing our time. And I think that's where a simplified vehicle, that is really fun sometimes, uh, but, but when we're trying to transport folks safely and, and effectively, um, it's not really where we want people to have to focus their time. So I think that's the nature of it. So, and, and Greg, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get in your slides here in just one second. I've got a good question here from, uh, from Rory Feely. Uh, he's asking about assuming that if, if our air vehicle is designed and meets our vision of simplified handling qualities, how is that different from the traditional level one handling qualities that we tend to hear about? And then how would the function of the, uh, of the pilot be different in this kind of simplified handling qualities aircraft? Yeah, um, those are great questions. And and Rory, um, I've seen you uh, be active out here in the world, so I look to look forward to catch up sometime. But the essentially the idea is um, when you're flying an aircraft with full time fly by wire, you're living in this world where you're protected uh, in an envelope sense, you're protected in a structural sense. We degrade those things in in failure modes, and we go back to basic flying conditions, and that's when we start to see accidents. Uh, when pilots are having to do abnormal things. And so, so that's one 
specific difference between simplified vehicle operation and some of the more traditional handling qualities that we look at is they persist even in failure modes. That's a really important piece because you need to train folks um, thoroughly for failure modes and even doing that humans are fallible. And so, so we kind of, we live that world today. That's the world of automation and augmentation today. And so, so to be able to bring the executive function skill set, understanding the radio communications, the navigation, uh, how to handle emergencies um, to the table, and then allowing a pilot to have like the protection of normal fly by wire is, is one of the early steps here. Um, I think from a, you know, what do pilots do standpoint, frankly, we're looking for um, the pilots that will fly our aircraft in the commercial operation will be uh, commercial airplane pilots with a special training set to fly this aircraft. Um, as you fly more in the system, I think, you know, everyone recognizes what you're mostly doing is that executive skill set. You're understanding what's happening around you. You're understanding the health and integrity of the vehicle. You're understanding what's happening with the people on board and being able to focus more of your time on that and directing the aircraft with your hands still, still flying the aircraft, but not worrying about like coupled axes. So for example, when I want to roll the aircraft, having to backload a little on the, on the elevator, right? That's something you don't even have to think about in, in these simplified aircraft in general. So, so like, it, it, um, I, I think your analogy, Frank, was really good in the beginning. Uh, if the right, you know, if we were out there still flying like the Wright brothers, almost unstable aircraft, aircraft we can make it work but uh, we'd be really tired and we would not be as safe. And so this is kind of another iteration of, uh, it's like it's an evolution of what we've been doing towards another step. And to be frank, like looking at the state of augmentation today where we kind of fail it down, we, it's not re reliable enough in its level of uh, protection that we typically, the fly by wires today, they go to a basic modes where you are still deflecting surfaces um, w when they start to see miscompares designing a system of high enough integrity and high enough reliability and redundancy so that you don't have to do that is kind of the holy grail that we're trying to get to. And eventually, I think we would see that where your head naturally goes is, well, geez, this is so easy to manipulate um, and working on the radio and navigation, communication, uh, navigation and, and um, executive thinking is where I need to focus. Maybe that is a different skill set. So there could be a new class of pilots that, and I think that's what Dave, you were alluding to, um, but but certainly I think, you know, we're imagining a while of, of using uh, all the critical skill sets that pilots have. Yeah, I, I agree, Greg. And I think um, what is different to me about level one handling qualities in a non-SVO airplane and level one handling qualities in an SVO airplane is in an SVO airplane, I think the pilot is on the loop, not in the loop and can take more time to do those strategic things that humans are really good at thinking in a, in a broader perspective. Um, so, so that's a new philosophy. But at the, if you peel the onion back on the aircraft and the way it's designed, I believe that the architecture of the flight control system and the failure modes, as Greg alluded to, that is a key enabler to not expect the pilot to jump in the loop and save the day after a failure. We'll assume that a failure will happen, but the basic handling qualities, there is no degraded mode. The basic handling qualities are the same. So just a, just a concept. And I think, yeah, that's a very important distinction and what really makes some of these concepts different from what you typically see today. Thanks for that, Dave. And, and everyone, I just wanna say thank you for the questions that we're getting. Uh, we're already getting more than we could possibly answer in an hour and a half. So just realize that even if I don't get to your question live today, the questions will be answered uh, either uh, through uh, email or, or posted onto the agilityprime.com website later on. So uh, we will get to those questions even if we don't get them live today. Okay, so in, in the interest of time, thanks for that, Dave. That was, that was a great presentation, good discussion. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and transition over to, to Greg. He's, he is, again, our government affairs guy on uh, Joby, so he's our primary POC as we're working with Joby on Agility Prime. Uh, he's got lots of history there, as you can read, uh, in this, in this uh, space of uh, um, eVTOL and uh, working through uh, some of the regulatory uh, hurdles that we start to see already and we expect to see in the future. So Greg, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you for your uh, presentation. I'll 
queue your slides up here so you can get started. Awesome. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so in this space, there, there's a lot of questions. We can jump right to the, the first slide, the, the first content slide, actually, if you want to. So um, just to summarize, I think everyone knows Joby. Um, we'll, we'll kind of go, you can, you can jump ahead. So we're based in California. We're flying this aircraft uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, by the way, we'll, we'll get to this in a second. We, we look at this and you can click once, I guess, and we'll show some data here. Um, we, um, there you go. So we uh, consider that aircraft to be an airplane that can also take off and land vertically. So the method of control that we're looking at is much more like the F-35B um, unified path than, uh, than maybe what uh, collective and cyclic stabilized controls might be. Um, that aircraft that we're showing you spends most of its time on its wings, flying on its wings. And the, the vertical aspects are kind of limited uh, in duration and, and the wave control vertically is very different than what a helicopter would be. The failure modes are very different than a heli what a helicopter would be. So we can go into that detail if there are questions later. Um, to, to frame this conversation, I think what's important about uh, what we're talking about today is it's like 85% or more of accidents, right? Fatal accidents um, today uh, are caused or are blamed on the pilot, right? So, so pilots are blamed for like 85% of the accidents. Um, th there is contributing factor there, right? Is it fair to have a partially fared, failed aircraft that has difficulties asking you to do something during an emergency you don't do typically, that's a stressful load. And so the point here is to start taking a bite out of that. Um, put systems in place so that we don't put pilots in those corners. Uh, the number one fatal cause of accidents today is loss of control. So that in the fixed wing world, that's a stall spin. Uh, in the helicopter world, it's very similar actually. It's a power mismanagement accident. Um, and so that's just basic, the human error of our fundamental moving in our hands and feet properly and focusing on the energy state of the aircraft and the coordination of the aircraft. Um, number two is control flight and terrain. Uh, number three is systems and component power plant failure. Uh, and then few, really interesting, the fourth fatal cause of accidents is running out of gas, that's fuel. Uh, unknown mid air collision, on, on and on. But the point here is that simplified vehicle operations can take a huge uh, chunk of those accidents and, uh, you know, make our lives more reasonable as pilots. So let's jump, jump ahead and kind of talk about how this has happened once before. So with controlled flight and terrain, um, and actually I think if you click once there's something, there's a build on that. There might be one more. There you go. So w once upon a time, we were seeing pretty steady, steady CFIT rates, and it was like the third cause of fatal accidents for, for a decade. And all of a sudden, it started to go away. And, um, you know, we were all scratching our heads initially because there was no new mandates, there was no new training, there was no new equipage in the aircraft that was measurable. But what happened was low cost GPS came along and everybody had moving map technology. And all of a sudden we stopped crashing into stuff as pilots, right? So technology came along, pilots adapted it, carried it on. It wasn't certified, just carried this equipment on and started saving lives like no other safety technology. Um, now, this is the kind of thing that technology can do when it's incorporated well. We, we can pick this apart and say like, hey man, these batteries could fail. These iPads, who knows if that's the right data, you could have a frozen screen, all true. But look what it did with all those uh, weaknesses. And so when we're able to like reasonably put in place technologies that can take wax at these big areas, like loss of control, that huge hanging issue, um, we really have huge opportunities. So um, jump ahead if you would, Sterling. Um, we can jump one more. So when we look at this issue, um, you, you start to say like, what does the pilot bring to the table? Uh, so, so if we're talking about the things that pilots are good at and things that pilots are not, let's look at everything a pilot has to do. So I sometimes look at a pilot as a processor, like a computer processor or a meat processor that, uh, some, uh, you know, a, a human processor. Um, and so we're manipulating things. We can move our, our processor around physically because we have our bodies. Um, we also have software that's in our head. And that, that is the, the stuff we learned when we started to fly. So some of that was given to us through reading material. Some of it was given to us through experience. So, that, so, so let's look and deconstruct that stuff that we've learned. So these are the chapters of technology and some of the areas that we've kind of learned over time. Plan, uh, you know, Pre-flight planning, inspection, decision-making is one of these things that's really an experiential thing. Uh, communications, systems management, 
taxiing, takeoff, landing, terminal procedures, navigation. Um, I think that one, I forgot what that is. It's missing its title. Uh, sorry about that. And then detect and avoid emergency procedures, evacuation, the X factor. So the X factor, by the way, is this idea that um, sometimes Sully Sullenberger does something he was never actually trained to do. And that's awesome. And then sometimes my wife tells me to wash the dishes and I don't because I don't always do what I'm told to do. And I would argue that the X factor can be sometimes more dangerous than good and vice versa. Like, I think it's an arguable term that we need to look at. You know, how, how often do we do and not do what we're supposed to do? Uh, oh, thank you very much. Um, manipulating the controls, there you go. That, that's what that was, I guess. Um, and so, so when we start to look at this and break this down, the reason I've done it in this fashion these are end-to-end -end skills. So we're looking at functions in a different way than engineers usually look at functions when we look at the aircraft. So if we normally look at a function like uh, the fly-by-wire system, so we say like, what integrity level do I need to make the fly-by-wire system get to to be good, as good as a human? Well, humans don't have a fly-by-wire system in them, but they do have stick and rudder skills. They do have takeoff and landing and taxiing procedures. And we can start to look and say like, how good are humans at basic airmanship or how good are humans at taxiing and takeoff and landing. And so that, so then like, here's a good example, detect and avoid, you know, we all debate this issue. How good do we need to have detect and avoid before we're going to be comfortable with drones flying around up in the sky? So I will tell you as a pilot, we probably don't see that well, right? I mean, we get a lot of traffic calls, uh, three miles, 12 o'clock and say like, uh, Oh, now I see them as they're going by. Right. And so, uh, it's not perfect, but it's good. And how good does that computer have to be? Does it have to be 10 to the minus ninth? Or if it were 10 to the minus fifth, is that way better than we're doing today? So the reason these skills breaking them in this way is important is it gives us an ability to start having bite-sized conversations. I think my last set here, if you can jump ahead, Sterling. So I, I mentioned this earlier, and one of the keys here is and I saw there's some great questions like, why is this any different than any existing autopilot or any existing avionics? Everything today is predicated upon this idea that we're very uncomfortable letting HAL have ultimate control of the spacecraft, right? So at the end of the day, we want the human to manipulate something and have a hard time doing something. That's, how, that's what we're comfortable with. Like, at least I want to work on the hydraulics, right? I don't want the system to have ultimate control. So that's where we are today. So give it a click, you'll, you'll kind of imagine we lost heading information. So if we lose heading information, what do we do today? We shut off the autopilot and we say like, hey, I know you're in icing and I know it's late at night and you're tired and there's mountains, um, but we have uh, inconsistent heading information. So Mr. Pilot, we're gonna shut that off and you no longer have this tool to help you. Uh, that's today's state of automation, right? So let's jump ahead to, the, to kind of where some fly-by-wire systems are and, and where we need to be. So let's imagine that same failure. So click one Sterling, like with a, a three channel traditional fiber wire system, um, the opportunity is, uh, okay, we, we know fiber wire one and two are now seeing a heading issue, but we've got plenty of consistent fused information. So we know where we are and we know what we're doing. We're gonna flag that. We're gonna say like, hey, there's a bad heading information. Uh, it's a maintenance item when you get there, but, and you can click one last time. I think this is the last one. And the, from the pilot perspective, great. I will let the mechanics know when we get on the ground. Um, I will continue uh, keeping things uh, going well up here in the sky. So, so this is what really in my mind is the physical differentiator between where we want to be with simplified vehicle operations and where we are today like, as the very first step into it. You can imagine over time, we can automate all those buckets of functions I talked about more and more. Eventually, once you've automated every single one of them, you are looking at autonomy, right? Once everything in that skill set that the pilots are being taught is can be easily automated, that, that's autonomy. And that could be a long way out, um, but these are like the bite-sized chunks that get us there in a really safe way. Uh, and, so, and so from our perspective at Joby, we're looking at going after the things that us pilots are not awesome at every single day, making our lives a little easier, and then still letting the pilot be the master of the ship, uh, deciding, making all the decisions, making, doing the communication, the navigation, frankly, controlling the aircraft, but just controlling the aircraft within bounds. Uh, so that's it. Thank you, Frank.
Thanks, Greg. I appreciate that. That's that's a it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting viewpoint on that. Uh, obviously, as a as an aircraft designer, these are I would expect to see a different approach to it in terms of of how you think about it. So, from from your perspective as as a player in the industry, how critical do you see SVO being to getting to that kind of commercial uh, viability and commercial success? So a lot of the folks on our team have talked about this in the past, but um, eVTOL specifically is going from a thrust borne lift onto a wing borne lift and back and forth through a transition phase there. And so, so from a human standpoint, that can be difficult if you look at the Harrier experience um, it's proven to be. Uh, and then if you look at what's happened with F-35B, um, the, the functions aren't exactly automated. The pilot still commands what speed the pilot wants to fly at and commands the direction they want the aircraft to go, but the pilot doesn't tilt nozzles and doesn't rate up and down RPMs or thrust. Um, and so by, by being able to command your path all the time in the same way, so instead of like a Harrier where you kind of transition from one set of controls to another, depending on the regime, in the F-35B, your hands on the same, back is up, down is forward, it, you know, the unified control scheme is, is very helpful. That's really important for eVTOL. So having uh, pilots of eVTOL be able to uh, fly these aircraft in a very simplistic way is critical. So, the, so if this had become really difficult, being able to hover or do thrust horn lift versus being on the wing, and if that was a very difficult skill set, you know, that takes extreme amounts of training. That's what the traditional powered lift ratings have been. Uh, and so by, by being able to employ a degree of simplified operation, you open your world to a lot of existing airplane pilots, existing helicopter pilots, the stick and rudder skills or the, uh, the pedal yoke and collective, uh, pedal collective and cyclic skills are not um, as necessary. And so it's, it's the functions that all pilots get over time that become fun uh, really critical. And, and that help, helps the success of this industry going forward. Okay, and then what? So one one more question before we move on. Um, why why wouldn't we just go straight to autonomous operations? Why why take this uh, middle step of simplified vehicle operations before just fully autonomous piloting? Yeah, good question. And so if you look at all the buckets on that screen, uh, I think there was thirteen of them. Um, Simplified vehicle operations probably checks away like four or five of them, uh, but it doesn't take care of things like detect and avoid. It doesn't take care of um, the decision-making pieces. So, so that's the technological side. There's a little bit of technological development and that's happening quickly. Um, I'll be frank, like we're ahead of where we think technology is gonna get in those spaces. So it's important to be able to, to um, begin these endeavors now. The other thing is the regulatory area, as that technology firms up in those areas that are a little looser, the regulatory environment will then firm up next and then public acceptance will firm up. So there's like a little bit of a time window that we see as a concern area. Um, and yet eVTOL, power, power density is always a question, right? Power density is wonderful, guys. It is, is where we want it to do what we're doing. Um, Everything off the shelf, industrialized technology put together in the right combinations does eVTOL wonderfully today. Uh, if you want to make it autonomous, um, I think that becomes a risk area. So, so we, uh, we're going down the simplified vehicle operation path. Great, thanks. I, that, that was really interesting. Thanks, Greg. It's, it's, uh, it's always an insight to me to hear things from an industry, industry perspective, because obviously on the government side, you know, we we're more of the operator user perspective than we are of the builder designer pers designer uh, point of view. So really appreciate that. That was that was uh, that was excellent. All right, so moving on, uh, so we can stay on schedule here. Uh, we've got Anna Dietrich on board now. She is uh, she's a, a a leader really in this industry, um, and uh, she's been working. Obviously, we, we, I mentioned already that uh, she helped to co-found the Community Air Mobility Initiative, but she's also been working on the uh, AC-377 ASTM Standards Committee uh, for this space as well uh, in some of the autonomy stuff. So I think it's, we're going to get some really good insights here from Anna. So uh, I'll go ahead and pull up your first slide there, Anna, and hand it off to you. 
Great, thanks so much. And I'm just going to start by saying that I followed directions. I only gave you two slides. So, <laughs> so I will talk a good bit to each of them. I think there was a fantastic conversation that, that Dave and Greg have already set up for us. Um, so one of the themes that uh, has been mentioned in the conversation already and that I've seen come through in the Q&A is the certification and regulatory connectivity between this and what we're doing already. And that is what ASTM AC377 was, was created to do um, for, for auto, autonomy and automation broadly, um, and uh, SVO is part of that. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, ASTM is the Standards Development Organization which hosts the majority, I will say, of the means of compliance that have been accepted for Part 23, Amendment 64, which is the performance-based rule that in many ways has made a lot of this possible. Um, and in fact, just uh, yesterday, I believe the Federal Register published um, notice of acceptance for a significant chunk, a, a new library for, for that rule. So um, the AC uh, designation within ASTM is, is for advisory committee. And what that is, is it's a, an opportunity for collaboration among different lines of um, technical development within that organization. So AC 377 uh, supports um, and hosts participation, I guess I should say, from all four of the aviation committees that you see listed there. So everything from light sport aircraft all the way through um, general aviation aircraft and the unmanned aircraft system. So it's a, a nice uh, meeting of the minds in that regard. So we're trying to come up with kind of holistic approaches for this. Um, one of the, the pieces of the AC committees is we don't write specifications the same way as, as F44, F38, et cetera would do. Um, we are publishing a series of technical reports to provide um, foundational information and guidance for the technical committees and for the industry in terms of how to think about certification for uh, autonomous and, and highly automated systems. The first two reports have been published. Um, those are the terminology and requirements framework and the developmental pillars of increased autonomy for aircraft systems reports. And the third is regulatory barriers to the more widespread use of autonomy in aviation that is under development now. Um, I expect to see that one published um, mid next year. Um, for the terminology and requirements framework, I'll just say a few words on that. It really is building off of the concept of the deconstructed pilot that Greg shared. So the idea is to uh, do a functional breakdown of what your system is going to be doing uh, that allows you to be flexible. Are you automating four things like Greg mentioned? Are you automating everything? Are you automating one slice? Um, and from there to go through a series of, of questions, a decision tree, if you will, of how to come up with a tailored set of requirements uh, that would um, adequately address the considerations for that function in that system. Um, it also takes into account where the ultimate uh, responsibility for that function lies. Is it with a, a human or is it with a system? Um, the second technical report, the pillars, as we call it, um, that covers a number of sort of foundational technical pieces that uh, the committee, with the cooperation from the FAA, uh, felt were not necessarily um, really as embedded into the industry as, as we would all like to see. So that has some um, basic um, basic technical information, um, best practices, and that kind of kind of information captured there. Um, it includes topics like development assurance, partitioning, modularity, dynamic consistency, um, and it touches on the interaction of the human with, with the system as well. So it covers this particular um, topic also. Um, the regulatory barriers is really just what it sounds like. We're doing a deep dive review of the relevant CFRs, so Part 91, Part 135, et cetera. Um, to look for places where there are large barriers to uh, to autonomy in the rule language. A lot of those things center around um, the definition of a person and the definition of pilot in command and how do we deal with it if the thing that is actually controlling the aircraft isn't um, a human PIC. So uh, trying to figure out what an appropriate approach would be uh, for that um, and to help us sort of modernize the rule language going forward as well. So that's the, the AC-377 work in a nutshell. I would encourage everybody to please um, get those first two reports and, and stay tuned for uh, the third. Uh, I'll also put in a quick plug. Uh, next week on the 29th, we're doing a symposium where you can learn more about this information also. So I, I would encourage you to, um, to check that out as well. Um, go ahead and move on to the next slide. So autonomy, 
writ large is the the focus of AC 377 and as we've been discussing SVO is sort of a flavor of that um, and I, there's been a, a fantastic technical conversation already on on what that is and from a technical perspective how how one might do it um, my purpose here is is definitely not to to reiterate an area of that um, but rather to, to just sort of note that in many ways this is flipping the script on how we have traditionally approached autonomy and high levels of automation um, and that that's directly tied to the certification um, conversations that we're having within AC 377 and the standards conversations there in that instead of just saying, oh, well, it'll be okay. We'll just dump it on the human. Um, you know, how do we avoid that? How do we create a system where you're not doing what, you know, what Greg described of you've got a, a tired, overwhelmed pilot that now all of a sudden has a failure condition to worry about. Um, so we're trying to, to structure that and to um, appropriately account for that in, in the work that's being done in the, in the standards efforts that are ongoing. Um, and I, I, I think Dave mentioned this, that it's an opportunity to connect um, pilot training and operational requirements with vehicle certification. And I think that's one of the really unique opportunities that we have in the aviation industry. There's very few places where your operational um, requirements and your physical item requirements are so closely coupled with the same agencies. So because we can work with the FAA to adjust both um, pilot training requirements, operational requirements, and aircraft or system certification requirements, we have the ability to kind of trade risk back and forth between these different pieces. And I think that's really powerful. And I think that's what's going to enable us to really realize some of the potential benefits of, of, these, um, of these systems going forward. Um, I also want to point out um, automation and autonomy are, are tossed around a lot, um, often interchangeably. I think they have, um, well, they, they have different technical meanings as we've defined in, in AC 377, um, but also they have different, um, I think, perceptions in the public eye. So if I um, pause for just a moment on the, the ASTM hat and put on my cami hat for a moment. I think we've seen um, increasing levels of, of automation become very well accepted in society. I mean, if you think about elevators, right? Silly example. Um, we used to have to have uh, somebody running the elevator. And basically now we have SVO for elevators and you don't, you don't worry about that anymore. You just get in and you push your button. Um, so I think, you know, as we get a, a history built and as people start seeing the benefits of um, incorporating these systems into into aviation in a way that they can actually see and be familiar with i think we'll we'll see a lot of progress on that front i think going straight to to how as greg said is probably going to uh, receive a lot more pushback than um, stepping through an incremental process which to one of the, the q a's um that's, that's definitely a reason to um to go with an SVO incremental approach. I think it'll do a lot to build acceptance of this and a lot to demonstrate the safety potential here. So um, yeah, I think that's, um, those are the key points that I wanted to make about um, the AC 377 effort. Um, really hope that folks can tune in on the 29th and happy to, to discuss any of this further as, as desired. Thanks, Anna. That's great. It's really interesting that, um, you know, you mentioned the linkage between uh, training and um, the hardware. And obviously in the Air Force, you see that linkage is probably even stronger than, than it is in, in the FAA and that we own, operate, maintain, certify our aircraft. Um, and we also train and certify our pilots. So there's a linkage there, but we're starting to see the same kind of things in terms of um, you know, we need to train our pilots differently. Um, they need different skill sets. They're becoming more systems operators and more higher level thinkers and less stick and rudder guys, I think, uh, as the systems become more capable and complicated. So I can certainly relate to what you were talking about there. Um, real quick, so what kind of, um, what kind of milestones do you see in the industry with respect to getting to SVO being a, a common, commonly accepted uh, kind of approach? I think we need to continue to build out um, 
the requirements library associated with these. So I mentioned, um, you know, mid next year is, is our, our target for having that third technical report published. I think that will be a very useful piece of the conversation when it comes to evaluating the existing regulatory structure. Um, how long it will take from that point to changing something or, or having a, an exemption um, or waiver pathway sort of defined. I, I don't really know um, about that. Um, it could be could be longer than I might like. Um, but I think that that's really the first step in the certification integration question of, of where are there actually problems and what do those problems look like and are they as significant a problem as we think they are? Um, or is it really just as simple as, as redefining how we think about a PIC and everything else then just takes care of itself? So I think there's there's some real foundational questions that will need to be discussed there. And then I think, um, you know, the industry talks a lot about going through a crawl, walk, run phase. And I think the implementing that crawl phase in a responsible and transparent way is going to be crucial for the, the longer term advancement of, of things in that public trust building. So early, early implementations of this um, with aircraft like, like Joby's um, will be really crucial for demonstrating that, that this works and that we can integrate with the existing systems that we have. Um, so, you know, none of the, the airspace infrastructure, the regulatory infrastructure, any of the other things that we have today for general aviation were built with high levels of autonomy or automation in mind. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't start with where we are and kind of go from there. So I think getting started with what we have is is very important and will go a long way to inform what that progression looks like in a more practical way. So I would say, you know, without getting ahead of our skis here. Um, we want to start with getting that regulatory landscape well defined. We want to start writing standards around um, these technologies as best we can today without the operational experience. And then really as soon as possible, we want to start getting that operational experience because that will then be a feedback loop that informs everything else going forward. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move on to Matt. Thanks, Anna. That was that was really informative. I appreciate it. Um, obviously, there's still a lot of work to do there. I think that's yeah, come help us do that, that work. Away from that. <laughs> there we go. So, uh, in in kind of that vein, I'm going to move on to uh, Dr. Dill Saver here. He's uh, a senior aerospace engineer uh, here in AFRL with me. Uh, we work together on a few projects now. Uh, he, but he also has uh, some of that airworthiness stink on him, having coming out of the Air Force Airworthiness Office on the flight control side of things. So uh, I think we can get some really interesting insights here on both development and certification of simplified vehicle ops. So uh, Matt, if you're up, let's. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, pull your first slide up. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Frank. Okay, so the first thing, so I'm gonna go ahead and admit that I am definitely not an expert on SVO. So the first thing I did was I tried to learn more about SVO. So I found this paper by uh, General Aviation Manufacturers Association, Gamma, that I think gives a really good overview of, of SVO. And so I pulled out some things, um, you know, kind of put, putting my certification hat on, you know, so some ideas that I, that I thought would be important. So first off, you know, it's the use of automation to reduce pilot operator training while increasing the level of safety. So my first thought was uh, that that's a very, uh, that's a very bold statement, no pun intended here, because I bolded it. Um, but, you know, uh, that's, that's going to possibly become uh, a little bit difficult. And then so looking further, you know, provides a framework in which to determine the appropriate combination of requirements for the automation and the human training necessary to achieve the desired level of safety. Uh, so once again, you know, we're, we're not completely cutting the pilot out of the loop here. It's a, it's a combination of how we want to use this automation or autonomy, um, as well as how are we going to train the human. And I'll, and I'll get to in a couple of slides why I think that's, that's, that's really a very important point. And then so finally, you know, looking at it, SVO connects aircraft certification requirements to once again to pilot operator training requirements in a manner that explicitly recognizes the potential for human-centered automation to reduce or, or replace training in particular functional areas where systems have demonstrated a capability to achieve a higher reliability level at performing functions that the average pilot across normal, off-nominal, and abnormal operating context. context. So I think, you know, 
the fact that we want to do this across uh, both normal operations and then the way I read these others is through uh, things like failures, through things like bad weather, um, I think just adds a level of complexity that, that just has to be considered. Uh, so if you'll, and I kind of, my, uh, my source, at least on my screen, got a little cut off. But once again, I took all that from that, the gamma paper. Um, yeah, go ahead, Frank, that's fine. So just looking through this, you know, some of the, some of the you know, I called them issues, you know, just some things that, that SVO has to kind of consider. And once again, I'm coming from a, uh, a, a military certification uh, background, so maybe in some ways slightly different than the FAA handles things. Um, but first off, so the autonomy or the automation, and you know, I'm going to kind of disagree with the last speaker. I, especially for a talk like this, you know, I'm not going to make a, uh, I'm not going to really get into an argument over autonomy versus automation because in my mind, uh, you know, automation is kind of a subset of autonomy. You know, autonomy is acting within certain bounds, and in in the sense of uh, automation, those bounds are just really well-defined and in a lot of cases much smaller. Um, but so we're going to look at probably, we're going to have new algorithms doing new things. So we need to be able to certify that those algorithms are acting correctly, as well as the software itself. So, you know, if I, if I have really great algorithms, but the software that I implement isn't actually implementing the algorithms as designed, then I'm going to have uh, questions there. So you have to look at both uh, kind of both via via the algorithms themselves as well as the software implementation of those algorithms and then depending on what we want to use here or what what functions that the um the sbo is going to going to do do we really have to start looking at new sensors required do we have to start looking at uh you know things that you know pilots eyeballs might used to do uh now are going to be handled by sensors so kind of an example that came to mind for me was if we start doing things like auto land especially in like an urban environment you know, how are we going to determine that we have a valid landing site, that we have a safe landing site, you know, that there's not a tree branch over the top. Um, and so either the pilot's going to have to do that, or if we want the automation to, to handle that or the autonomy, probably more. Uh, in this case, you know, how, what kind of vision sensors are we going to have to have? And then how do we certify those sensors are operating correctly um, under all light conditions? You know, it, it's not an easy problem, you know, just Google KC46 remote vision system. Uh, and all the problems they're having there, you know, getting a good, uh, good vision under all lighting and weather conditions is definitely a, a hard problem. Um, and then furthermore, so looking at contingency management. So, you know, some other speakers have talked about this, but, you know, contingency management, especially for autonomous systems is absolutely not trivial. Um, you know, how do we know that things are acting as they are supposed to be acting? How are we monitoring our systems? Um, and then, you know, who, who is actually doing the monitoring? So are we having the pilot do the monitoring um, or is the autonomy monitoring the system states? Um, and so I found another paper uh, that I'm really gonna get into in a lot of detail on the next slide, but dealing with automation and aviation and looking at a bunch of different accidents. And uh, so, so the quote I pulled from that paper was that, although automation may do what it's designed to do, design specifications may not take into account certain unlikely but very possible conditions leading to unsafe automation behaviors. So once again, it, it's, it's relatively simple and straightforward to design automation for nominal conditions. But it's really when we start talking about hardware failures, when we start talking about uh, adverse weather, when we start talking about humans using them in ways we didn't anticipate they would use them, is really when it starts getting difficult. And so we, we, you know, we have to look at contingency management and just kind of the monitoring as of the system as a whole. And you know, how do we split that up between a pilot or the autonomy? Um, and kind of one thing that I've kind of noticed is that, you know, a lot of things, the easy thing is to say, oh, well, we'll just have the pilot monitor it. But you know, a lot of, uh, to me, you know, kind of a key driver behind this is we want less training requirements. Well, now if we have the pilot that has to monitor all these automation systems and all these subsystems and figure out what's working correctly and what isn't, you know, are we really now cutting down at all on training requirements? And maybe it's just a different type of training as opposed to, you know, uh, stick and rudder training. Now we're doing just all kinds of, uh, you know, automation training and computer system training and things like that. Um, and then so finally, I think the really the key thing here uh, is pilot vehicle interface. So it's absolutely essential that the pilot knows what the automation is and is not doing at all times. Um, 
which once again could drive additional training. You know, and it has to be very well represented to the pilot, the current state of the automation and uh, what functions the automation is and isn't, uh, isn't doing. And, you know, that could be very different from aircraft to aircraft, in which case you would have to have, just like we do now, you know, specific uh, aircraft training for each aircraft that you're getting into. Uh, so next slide, Frank. And so kind of pulling a little bit more on that. So looking at uh, the MITRE report on automation accidents and it, it lists, and this is, if anyone's interested, you know, this is, I've found a, a lot of great information in this paper. Uh, some of it's a little older from the 70s and 80s, but I think it's still, uh, still very valid in a lot of cases. But it lists a lot of incidents where misunderstanding, the pilots not knowing what the automation was or wasn't doing, either the direct cause of the accident or a contributing factor. You know, looking at the recent crash a couple of years ago, the Asiana plane in San Francisco, where, you know, if I remember right, you know, I think the, the pilots thought that the aircraft was controlling speed and thrust, but it actually wasn't. So they just kept getting slower and slower and below glide slope. Um, and so, you know, kind of looking through this, you know, some things I, I, I kind of, some key questions that they list about, uh, you know, kind of relevance to SVO or things that really need to be considered when, when we start doing this is, you know, should the automated systems inform the operator after making a change or only make a change that has been acknowledged by the operator? And once again, those, those are design choices that are, are going to be made by the manufacturer, but we really need to think about the, the uh, kind of the consequences of those choices. Um, and, you know, all they, are they, I think I kind of butchered this one, but uh, are there alternatives for practicing with the real system? You know, can we get, you know, a simulator? Maybe when you buy an aircraft, you also get a desktop simulator so you can, uh, you know, kind of play around is maybe a little bit of a bad word, but you know, so you can get familiar with the, the interface, get familiar with, with the way things are going. Um, and so another thing that, that they found uh, that psychologists, I guess, have found is that complex monitoring degrades with time on watch. Um, so in, you know, there's different types of degradation here, but so if a pilot is just kind of more just sitting back monitoring as opposed to actively doing things that they've shown, you know, that the attention span, it, it starts degrading with time as that goes on. Uh, so you need to make sure taking that into account, um, you know, how can automatic systems be more interpretable? You know, I, I feel like this is a big question, not only here, but just kind of in AI and autonomy as a whole, you know, how, how do we know exactly what the automation is doing and more importantly, why it's doing it. Um, so, the pilot can make informed decisions on what's going on and whether or not he or she needs to kind of act to change, you know, kind of almost back to the contingency management, you know, are things operating as they should be? And if not, what actions should I be taking to make it uh, safe, make it safe? And finally, will, you know, will, will logic for smart warning systems be too complex for operators? You know, are we really just going to get into a situation with information overload? Um, and then finally, you know, another point from this, uh, from a joint NASA industry workshop, I can't remember the year, this might have even been back in the 90s somewhere, is that, you know, kind of going back to monitoring degrading with time is that, um, you know, are we just going to, is the pilot going to become bored and complacent and just really not paying attention then to what's going on, depending on how much automation. Um, and I think this kind of comes back, you know, I've, I've met in the past with, with uh, some of the autonomous car companies. Um, and really, if we start getting into, if you're familiar with the SAE levels of automation, you know, we really start uh, getting into kind of level two, level three, where the kind of the automation is in charge, but the, the human still has to be in the loop monitoring. And they're actually kind of, there's some studies that have shown that that's really the most dangerous place to be. You know, it, it's actually much safer to have either the, the, driver or in our case the pilot doing everything or doing absolutely nothing in the case of full automation that really we get into the gray area and if you've looked at you know look at some of the ntsb reports on some of the tesla accidents uh which is you know arguably in the in the two three range and it's really driver inattention you know more of a you know a lot of times people talk about an under trust of automation but it really in these cases it's an over trust of automation uh people think that you know in one case the guy was watching a movie you know, when he's supposed to be actively monitoring what's going on. So, you know, it's, it's just, 
how, you know, this middle ground can be very dangerous. And so we just need to make sure that, that we're really uh, taking that into account and the human factors of everything uh, when, when looking at SVL. And I think that is all I had, Frank. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate that. That was I. I heard some common themes running through that in terms of training, transparency, uh, safety. I think those are all important things to remember as we start designing systems that can also be certified. Because obviously, if they can't be certified, then that leaves us in kind of a a place where we're stuck. And and in 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 mass offense. I asked him, I think uh, two weeks ago, I said, hey, would you be willing to talk on automation with SVO? And he said, yeah, sure. I just don't really know what SVO is. And I said, okay, great. We're going to do it on Wednesday at uh, 2.30 or 2 o'clock. So we'll see you then. So you can obviously see why he's got a PhD because he went and found papers and he's got references. And I did my introduction with my own opinion on things. So the, there's a big difference between a guy who really knows what he's talking about and somebody who just likes to hear himself talk like I do. But anyway, uh, along those lines, uh, Matt, any, any thoughts on how maybe uh, modeling and simulation might come into play when it comes to certification of SVO? Do you see, do you see any, um, any radical kind of changes we need in that environment? Do we have the tools necessary now to do that sort of thing? Do you see places that we need to develop? Um. You know, I, I, I don't really see where, where SVO is going to cause any really driving of any new modeling in SIM, um, you know, but, but on the flip side, you know, I, I do believe that, you know, m &S will be very important uh, as we're, you know, as we're doing things like pilot, even, you know, pilot instrument design and, you know, how are we telling, you know, normal caution warning advisory type stuff and how does that all look and how do we prevent operator overload and, you know, a lot of those things, you know, once again, I'm not really a human factors person, but, you know, a lot of those things they can study in the simulator and, and figure out, you know, how that, you know, what, what the best way to, to present information to the pilot is. And then obviously, you know, when we're designing autonomy, um, you know, we varying levels of m &S depending on where, you know, the, the kind of design maturation is at the time. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really see anything where, where we need to change the type or the, you know, the, the way we do m &S. Yeah, yeah. M&S has gotten pretty powerful over the last decade, really, or, or longer, but I, I think there's a lot of capability there. And I like the idea of leveraging it for, for getting there. I, I think, uh, you know, as our autonomous systems get more and more complicated, I think there's, there's a lot of work to be done there. Uh, as well, but um, yeah, and then and and one more thing. So, do you do you foresee from a certification perspective? Do you see them uh, starting to kind of dictate the the controls uh, from a simplified vehicle operations perspective? You know, I mean, is it going to be PlayStation or is it going to be Xbox? Is it going to be, you know, do you, do you kind of see them? Uh, the regulatory agencies kind of driving towards a singular type of controls or maybe leaving it more open? Um, that's a good question. I don't, I mean, I think in general, you know, speaking at least from the Air Force, we, we like to tell people what to do, not how to do it. So I, I feel like, you know, how, whether you want to go with an Xbox controller or just a, a whatever, a touchscreen iPad or, you know, what, whatever you want to do, as long as you can show that your entire, right, because we, we don't certify a, a controller, you know, we certify an aircraft as a whole. So as long as you can show that your entire system has the required levels of safety, um, I think you could get away with any of those. That's perfect. Yeah. Excellent. All right. I appreciate it, Matt. Thanks. I'll, I'll let you off the hook now, <laughs> as, at least until we get another question that's good for you. Uh, but uh, in the interest of time, so we're running low here, uh, but I certainly don't want to miss out on uh, Robin Reddell's uh, talk here. And so he's, he's a leader also in this space, uh, working at McKinsey and Company, obviously providing a lot of really valuable consultancy. Uh, he's got an, uh, a, a background in the aerospace world from both, uh, from both his bachelor's and master's at MIT, but also as having been an airline pilot. So 
he's got a really interesting background to present to this and I think uh, some really interesting points to make. So Robin, I'll pull your first slide up for you and, uh, and hand it off. Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, thanks for hosting this, the whole Agility Prime team. And, uh, you know, what a fascinating discussion, you know, as a pilot, uh, I, I love the technical debates. And uh, as an instructor, I think about this. Uh, but as we as we kind of look at this from McKinsey perspective, uh, we, we look at this industry from different angles. And one of those is really the question of economically, how is this all going to work? And, you know, where's money going to be made? And how is it going to develop and uh, you know provide services to people and so one of the big questions we recently looked into is where are the pilots going to come from right pre-covid we had a bit of a pilot shortage and we had a question around you know if we're going to see a ramp up um, that will some of these vehicles being successful and many of them piloted uh, you know what do we need from a pilot perspective and what is that going to cost and what is that going to matter from an economic perspective so there's a few things i wanted to share because svo does play a big role within that if you go to the next slide here, Frank, one of the things we see is there's four challenges really um, with piloted vehicles for the AM industry, right? The first one is kind of obvious, but there's a cost challenge, right? As you put a pilot on an aircraft, uh, that adds additional costs, both to actually carry that pilot, but also to train that pilot, to pay that pilot. Um, and so there's a cost challenge. Secondly, there's a sourcing challenge. We talked about pilot shortage, and even though, you know, right now there's a lot of uh, pilots looking for jobs given what happened to commercial airlines in the last couple of months in COVID, uh, you know, by the time AM really kicks up, we're probably going to be back in a growth mode and, uh, you know, we'll see potential challenge there. Um, then we have an aircraft design challenge, right? If you design aircraft for autonomy versus you design aircraft for piloted, it's a, it's quite a different task from a human interface to how you've designed the cabin, uh, actually how you design flight procedures, et cetera. And so, you know, as we're thinking about designing these aircraft, there comes some cost into that. And then lastly, there's a customer experience challenge, right? Uh, if, you, if you have someone else with you in the cabin, or, you know, you know this from Uber drivers today, or, you know, what music they choose to have, or even what the rotor and the wear impacts your, your experience in the, in the ride share. And so similar challenges could come up. And so if you just click on this once, I think to highlight here where SVO is really relevant is on the first three, right? I think the cost challenge, if we find ways through SVO to massively reduce the training effort and, uh, you know, uh, create pilots that can fly SVO vehicles much faster, um, you know, that'll help with the cost challenge. On the pilot sourcing challenge, similarly, right? I think today, you know, we source pilots by telling them you have to go through a commercial pilot course. It's probably going to take you close to, you know, two years. It's probably going to cost you two, you know, 80 to 150,000, depending on, you know, whether you do rotorcraft or fixed wing. And so, you know, sourcing pilots uh, will be much easier if we have an easier pass into, into that profession. And then lastly, the design challenge, of course, SVO impacts, depending on how we build the aircraft and what technology we put in there. So let's jump to the next page and quickly call, talk about the cost challenge here because that's one of the, the bigger ones we looked at. So of course, these numbers will move around depending on what assumptions you make. But if you take a reasonable set of assumptions for what AM will look like, you know, you get to a point where a pilot that flight is probably gonna be at about double the cost of a, you know, of a, of a non-piloted you know, autonomous flight. If you look at it by a per seat mile point, and, you know, you see the breakdown here, right? The pilot salary adds, adds quite a bit of cost to a, to a vehicle. You need to train the pilots, again, depending on what assumptions you make there. But if you look at, you know, advanced rotorcraft today, you're probably looking at $20,000 a year just for, you know, simulator check rides to, uh, you know, to keep your currency. So that factors in. You know, there's a designer's option. And then the last big one here is really the occupied seat, right? So if I have a two-seat aircraft and I need one seat for a pilot, uh, you know, that takes down the, the availability of seats that I can use for paying customers and so therefore the cost, right? Same if I use one seat out of four in a, in a larger vehicle. So SVO really will have impact on a couple of these. So Frank, if you click on the page, you know, one is the pilot salary, right? As we use SVO and we make it less of a specialized profession that needs, you know, two years of training uh, up front that people invest in, we can probably have this at a lower you know, lower pilot salary and open this up to other demographics of people that, that will fly these aircraft and will help with pilot salary. I think on pilot training, that's the second one where it will help, right? So if we don't need to go to a expensive full flight simulator uh, every six months to keep current, you know, definitely will help there. And then lastly on design adoptions, of course, um, you know, we'll, we'll see some impact there. And so SVO 
will help bring down the cost of AAM, which then will help adoption, will help make this a mass, uh, you know, transportation system rather than, you know, a toy for the rich. And I think that's something many of us are looking forward to. Next page, please. So to talk quickly about the pilot challenge, and I know there's a lot of debate around this. We published a paper pre-COVID uh, with these numbers and we said, look, um, you know, today we roughly have about 360,000 pilots, you know, business aviation is about say 50 to 60,000 and then airlines have the rest. You know, we were going to see attrition over the next 10 years of about 150,000. And then as the airlines grow and as UAM comes on board or AAM, you know, we will see additional need for pilots. Now, COVID had changed that a little bit, but not that much. I mean, two things, and Frank, if you just hit the, uh, the slide forward one at once. Uh, two things we'll see, right? One is by 2028, you know, we will probably, you know, be back on a growth path for commercial aviation and business aviation, right? And so airlines today are hurting, we're down significantly, but, you know, they are projected to ramp up by 2024, 2025. So when this industry really becomes live, right? So when we're starting to see scale in AM, we will probably be back in the growth rate for airlines and for business aviation. So there's going to be a bit of a shortage just from that. And then the second thing to notice is we're going to have heavy attrition over the next years, right? People are leaving the profession because they're furloughed or we see a lot of early retirements that the airlines are providing incentives for. And as a result, probably that attrition error will go up quite a bit. And therefore, we'll need to train way more people to actually get back to our 2028 number, right? And so you will see the influx for training probably going up by another 50, 100, 150,000. And so that means money on the one hand, right? Uh, it's expensive. We, we think if you had to train the 60,000 AM pilots here uh, with traditional means, you're looking at four to six billion dollars, just the training cost, right, for an industry. Uh, so SVO can massively help with reducing that, uh, that cost, but it will also help with the timeline um, and it will help with the people that we can draw into the profession that will actually qualify for this, right? So if you no longer have to do a two-year, uh, you know, in-depth study, uh, you know, opens up to, to other, other uh, demographics. So that was a quick overview of how we look at uh, the economics here and, and uh, how uh, you know, SVO will impact those. Um, you know, Frank, on the next page, just very briefly, we did publish a white paper on this. It's freely available on our website, so you can download it from there. Um, and then feel free to reach out to me with any questions. Very happy to engage on the topic. Thank you so much for hosting, Frank. Thanks, Robin. That was really interesting. It's it's funny. I've been I've been keeping my finger on the pulse of the whole pilot shortage thing partially just have, being a pilot, but also because a lot of my friends in my year group are certainly in that kind of uh, that window of they were all getting out, getting the pilot jobs that are now getting furloughed. So it's very interesting to me to to keep track of that. And and, and all the talk about, you know, the causes of the of the pilot short uh, of the pilot shortage and all the uh, solutions. I, I very rarely hear anybody talk about urban air mobility being a draw on the pilot population or or uh, being a requirement to that. And certainly, I think you know, COVID's kind of taken the front seat to uh, to the pilot shortage. But in the end, I think in the long run, as you mentioned, you, the attrition numbers go up when you start coming back because you're not going to get everyone back that has left now um, because they're going to go off and do other things, and some some guys are going to like that. Right. So it, I think that's a huge problem uh, from a pilot perspective. And if you think about the Uber model uh, to urban air mobility, if, if all our Uber drivers had to have very specialized licenses to be able to drive an Uber, uh, suddenly that business plan has trouble as well. So uh, it is interesting to to uh, to think about this from from that perspective in that in that line or along those lines. Um, what do you see as uh, as kind of a uh, a method to how how do we prime the kind of the the pilot training pipeline to allow us to uh, to fulfill these requirements for SVO? Yeah, I think it it really will come down to what the certification levels are and what we can get to, right? So if you depending on what what taxonomy you look at, if you look at SVO two, we're thinking about a few weeks of training versus two years of training, right? And if you think about the curriculum, right, what you have to go through either today as a commercial you know, fixed wing pilot or helicopter pilot, you look at things like, you know, turbine, turbine engines, you look at things like high altitude aerodynamics, you look at things like, you know, weather phenomenon, long range flights, 
all things that are not relevant to this environment, right? So if we, on the, on the theoretical side, can really skim down the curriculum to the relevant pieces and add a few, right, for the urban environment, and then on the actual flying skills side, you know, have the vehicles that would truly enable, you know, um, a, a much more simplified, simplified interface, you know, we could get training, training times down to a few weeks and, you know, ca call it the requirement for candidates to get into the industry would be much lower at that point as well, right? I mean, I, I look at some of the things that, you know, so the startups are doing, um, you know, there's a helicopter company, as I'm sure many are familiar in, in LA, which has started to, you know, do a bit of an iPad interface for, for smaller helicopters. And, you know, you, you, could, you could get people trained very rapidly on that. And then you bring down the cost from, you know, call it 100,000 to get your license to something more like 5,000 or 3,000, right? And so you get a different bunch of people interested in the job. Um, you know, you, you provide an opportunity to enter aviation, you know, through that pass and you make it a lot cheaper. I think those are some of the prerequisites we need to see. If we try to grow, you know, advanced air mobility with classical pilot licenses, Right? Um, the, the cost function just will not work out properly. And I think the value proposition will not work out because there's one thing that, you know, we're telling pilots in the space at that point, which is, listen, we want you to come in and fly people in the urban area. And, you know, you're going to have to invest in the pilot license up front and make this career choice. But we're also very keen of automating you away because everybody's talking about autonomy. And in five years, you're going to be out of a job and out of a career. And really, you're just here until our computers are good enough. Right. And it's, it's not a great value proposition to convince people to spend, you know, two years and $100,000 to get a license. Right. And so question is, how do we integrate that with other other aerial modes? Right. Could this be a stepping stone like regional airlines into a later career? Right. Those are kind of the things that the industry need to figure out. So a lot for us to do to really kind of unlock the, the pilots into the space. Yeah, uh, that's that's really kind of taking the, the thought to the next level, because everybody focuses on the vehicles. Some people will focus on the, you know, the control of the vehicle and that sort of thing, but really to take it from a perspective of a simplified vehicle operator and, you know, what his life might be like and what, what kind of future plans he might have. That's really, that's, that's really high level thinking. Really appreciate that. That's, it's an interesting perspective. Uh, I, I, I think, unfortunately, we're running out of time, and uh, I just want to say real quick to everybody on the panel, thank you so much for your insights and for the uh, for all the um, all the presentations and the questions that you've been able to answer. Uh, I, I I think uh, this is a really exciting space to keep an eye on for uh, from all those perspectives that we mentioned: and certification, safety, design, hardware, software automation. Uh, um, and so I, I think this is an area where uh, if we want to see, as we talked about, if we want to see this urban air mobility become a reality, then this is something that needs to happen. So we need to keep our finger on the pulse of that. So uh, again, thank you for all the panelists. Uh, and I'll pull up the slide again, if I can get it to get there quickly of everybody that was involved, just so that uh, we can get everybody's name up there again real quick. But um, uh, I, I look forward to uh, continuing our, our discussion on this. Again, if you have a question submitted that uh, hasn't been answered yet, we will uh, get to those and we will post the answers on the Agility Prime website for uh, everybody to reference. And, uh, and I don't, uh, I don't, Sterling, I don't know if you're there, if you want to uh, take it uh, and, and give kind of a plug for the next Ask Me Anything. I'm not sure what the next uh, topic is, but I'll, I'll leave it there for that. Yeah, so thank you, Frank. Appreciate everyone tuning in. The next one will be next Friday, back to our usual times, continuing with the ecosystem tour. So we'll have a good group of folks on from the ecosystem to talk through their things. So thanks, everyone, for joining us and uh, look for the email on that stuff. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for hosting. Thanks. Thank you all. Thanks. Yeah. Continue talking. Thanks.